Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Perkelhammer. So today I welcome back Mark Vanderwall to the show. What's going on there, Mark? Hey, Keith. Thank you for having me on a second time. Yeah, you know, I think the last time you were on was about nine months ago, and and we had a uh, you know a great chat. So I think uh, it would be, it w I thought it would be awesome to have you back on the show. So um, yeah, I see there's a lot of people tuning in out there, and a lot of um, uh, yeah, okay, a lot of people in the chat there. That's cool. But let me uh, let me get this out of the way before we start here with uh, with Mark, just in case people don't know who Mark is. He has been a reef tank hobbyist. It's 28 years now. I know last time I had you on was 27, so I just assumed 28 years. Yeah, I think first reef tank was 95, and my first saltwater tank was in 92. So, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. You're pushing 30, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting up. So, uh, Mark was also the co-host of the very popular Reef Therapy podcast with Jake Adams. He was an active member on Reef Central in its early years, earning Tank of the Month way back in 2001. Mark did moderate briefly on Reef Central in the heyday, and he has written occasional articles for Reef Builders as well as Reef Central. He uh, is a self-described reformed metal halide user recovering SPS <laughs> addict. Mark currently enjoys a couple of mixed reef tanks but before we dive in with mark i want to thank both sponsors of the show bulk reef supply and ecotech marine i really appreciate these companies supporting the show and i also appreciate all you folks out there tuning in please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and um yeah we uh we encourage you folks to drop questions in the chat i see there's a lot of people in the chat already and and uh yeah mark it's quite apparent that you've been missed because uh, i see a number <laughs> of comments about uh, about uh, seeing you on on YouTube again. So, um, oh my God, I missed you, Mark! Exclamation point. I can't <laughs> even pronounce the uh, that person's name. I I, I apologize. Um, Trevor Hiller, glad to see Mark back on video. The Lucent Fish, Mark Vander Woo, with a uh, exclamation point. 
Um, Triggerfish45, good to see you on the stream, Mark. So, Mark, it was, um, it was great to actually see you in person in Restock. So we chatted, you know, on the live stream nine months ago. But it's, it's always good to kind of, you know, be able to see the person live and in person. How, um, you know, that was my first reef stock. And you mentioned to me before the show that that was your uh, first uh, reef stock. How, how was your experience at, uh, at reef stock this past year? You know, it was good. Um, I, hadn't, I, I haven't gone to a lot of shows over time just because a lot of shows fall on either, you know, a Labor Day, Memorial Day, or some type of weekend where I've got family plans. And then... The thing with restock is I, I always sort of skipped it because uh, I've got family in Colorado uh, on my wife's side. So I was always there in the summertime anyway. So I'd always see Jake in June or July and hang out at the studio with him. And so I was like, ah, I don't need to go to restock. I'll see you in you know a couple of months. Um, obviously, this one was different. I think you know, this one was probably the closest to uh, you know a get together or a wake you know, after Jake's passing. Um, and as far as the experience, you know, I was, I was actually saying this to my wife when I got back that, uh, you know, there's that famous saying, like, don't meet your heroes or don't, you know, you, like you, you develop impressions of people that you admire from afar mm -hmm. and then you meet them in person yeah. and then they don't live up to your hype. But it was actually the opposite for me where everyone I met uh, was great, you know, including you, you know, all the people that I've either followed on social media or YouTube or, you know, just people I've never met before. Um, everyone was uh, either as great as I thought they would be or even better, you know. So that, that was a really cool experience and, and sort of um, uh, brought me back into the whole like, oh, this is, you know, this is a wonderful community that we have. Like we got a lot of great people in this hobby, which I needed because, you know, I think my big, uh, I guess my tether to the hobby for a long time was mostly just chatting with Jake, you know, and his passing, you know, put me sort of, uh, untethered, I guess, from the hobby. I mean, I, I, I developed some good friendships with people that were friends of Jake's and stuff, but, um, I think that, that restock really brought it all back together for me. And, uh, so yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah, it was a, it was a great experience for me too. Did, um, did a lot of people come up to you that you did not know just to say yes. hi? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that really hit me in the feels too, because it's just, um, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, I just never understood fully why uh, a lot of people loved reef therapy. Uh, not not to disagree with them in that sense, but it's just, you know, for me, it was just me catching up with a friend once a week over a beer and just chatting about whatever philosophical or random thing, you know, that, that, that was bugging our brain that week. And and uh, I just heard that it, you know, resonated with a lot of people. Like uh, some folks were saying they were listening to it on the way to Reefstock mm. in their car. And it just, yeah, that, that uh, I don't know, it meant a lot hearing that. I really appreciated it. And I, I just, uh, yeah, like I said, it hit me in the feels a little bit. Like, wow, you know, that didn't have any idea that it would make such an impact to people. Well, it, w it was a very, you know, organic conversation that you guys had every episode and i think it was just kind of like a lot of um you know us felt like flies on the wall in terms of you guys having those uh, conversations and and it was just chock full of information it was just uh some good mojo there and you guys had that that great rapport so it um yeah i think that's you know for me personally i think that's why it really was a um you know one of those kind of must see reef tv type of um things that uh were, were, you know, was on my list in terms of content on YouTube. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it we, we wanted it not to be, um, uh, you know, all about gear or all about this. We just wanted to have it be like a natural conversation that you might hear at a trade reef show or, you know, just hanging out with your buddy, you know, that comes over to check out the new coral you got, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, and for Jake, it was, you know, therapy for him. Uh, that's why he called it that because, you know, he's he was so heavy in the industry and making all these videos and stuff that, you know, he would just call me up sometimes and like just want to, uh, I don't know, take a different, you know, approach to just having a discussion that, that wasn't, um, you know, focused, you know, on, you know, producing content. He just wanted to either vent 
or you know just talk about the random stuff so uh you know <laughs> he that's where he came up with the name and uh, yeah i guess it sort of turned into that so um just a couple of comments from the um from the viewers barry goss senior it was it was a great total bs swapping session between you guys watched it live and miss you man um blue reef we don't realize what we have until we lose it at least we can watch it thank god for that thanks jake and mark um adam Moore, welcome back to youtube mark so yeah it um it is certainly some content that um that i think we're all missing and and i'll i'll get to that uh obvious question i think in a second i just want to thank chill Chili Wills Reef for the uh, for the super chat, and uh, we'll we'll do a quick answer to this question here that um, that Chili Wills sure. uh, has. Uh, do you feel if you have a thriving reef tank, you should have to replenish your cleanup crew? Shouldn't they reproduce as well? You want to tackle that one more? Yeah, I believe in replenishment. Um, your snails are going to dwindle, you know, over time, and and trochus snails do reproduce. I've never had much luck keeping them in a sustainable. Uh, way, but um, I, you know, and man, I, I could turn this five second question into a 30 minute discussion, <laughs> but um, you know, my take on keeping reef tanks is that, you know, the only way you can tackle algae, and you should really go listen to Richard Ross about this because he does a much better take on it. But I think I'm going to have him uh, on uh, next week with Ben. So it'll, um, okay. You know, yes. Yeah, so you guys can get into yeah. it. But I mean, um, herbivory is the way you keep algae under control, right? I mean, if you starve a tank of nutrients, it only, I think, gets you into growing other things like cyano and dinos and all that, which are a pain in the butt. Uh, I think when you can grow the stuff that things like to eat, uh, you're in better shape, but then you got to have the things that eat it, you know, the snails and the, you know, herbivor herbivorous tangs and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think every once in a while, you know, and you'll know when it's sort of time to throw in some new urchins and snails. They just, they tend to, after a while, kind of um, go down in population. What about, what do you think? Yeah, no, I would completely agree with that. I think it's over time. It's it, And it's, sometimes it's kind of easy to lose track of that stuff, uh, you know, because the cleanup crew is probably like the last of your concerns if the tank is looking good and, and things are like sort of on, on uh, autopilot. But, um, yeah, I think that... Um, Depending on what you have, and if you got if you got a sand bed, then um, you know you might not be totally aware of what uh, is still in that sand bed. And I know I've, I've put Nasaria snails in my sand bed beds in the past, and when I've removed those sand beds, you know I really don't have a lot of Nasaria snails that I'm fishing out of the sand bed. So I think um, yeah, I think whatever you're putting in the tank in terms of that cleanup crew is probably a good idea to um, top it off every now and then. Yeah, and sometimes it's funny because you think you have a new nutrient issue because you're suddenly seeing algae start to pop up in areas. But then really, I think what's happened is that your cleanup crew has uh, finally hit a tipping point of not having enough or something. Yeah, um, I've had that happen. And, you know, it's it's funny because you forget how effective they sometimes are. I had um, these gyres start to get, you know, turf build up because the tangs couldn't get above and graze on them. I thought, you know, where the hell is this coming from? And then I realized, uh, you know, I didn't really have a lot of snails left in the tank. And then you order some snails and you pop a few right onto the gyre pump. And, you know, the next day it's clean. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's probably yeah, why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That usually is the uh, the ticket. Um, John Kidd, I'm Mark. Miss hearing your voice, buddy. Um, Larry and Nir Niranant, one of my favorite therapy sessions was Mark and Jake talking about algae. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We went deep on that one. Uh, that and then our three-hour, was a two- or three-hour protein skimmer discussion. That was a two-parter, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. No, I miss everybody, too. I miss, uh, I miss the comments. It was always fun after putting one out, hearing other people's ideas, thoughts, and questions that were generated out of the content. Um, I think that was one of my things was I, we just we had a good crowd that was actively – commenting on the YouTube uh, side of the podcast. And uh, it was really fun to keep uh, track of everybody's feedback there. Um, so, all right, here's the uh, $99,000 question. What, um, what, what, what do you uh, see? If you can answer this question, what, what do you think is in your future in terms of YouTube, reef therapy, what have you? I don't know yet. Um, 
I, I talked to Raj quite a bit at Reefstock, uh, and I think he has a really good idea on what to do with Reefstock. Um, he's got obviously a, a fantastic panel of contributors now, you know, um, and, uh, you know, um, I told him I'm around, I'm happy to contribute. Um, so, uh, and I think we, you know, I think we'll probably, uh, hopefully I'll be there on the first one and then we'll see where that goes. So that's, I guess more a question on Raj. It's, it's his baby and he's got a vision. Um, I, I think it's tricky cause I was never really on the reef builders payroll. I just did it for fun. Um, I, I'm not into gaming or video games or anything like that, but you know, I've always heard of this concept of like side adventures in a video game where you go do something else in the, within the video game. And, you know, in my game of life, re therapy was like this little side adventure I did <laughs> once a week. Um, and it was just chatting with a friend and, um, because Jake was a close friend of mine, uh, you know, he, he every once in a while he'd call in a favor, like, Hey, can you come to inner zoo with me? I need someone to help me cover new products. You know, can you, uh, cover this? pet expo because I've got a conflict, uh, or he'd have too many things, products to review. So he'd be kind enough to send me something and say, Hey, can you write an article? You know what you dislike and dislike about this. So I think people got the impression that I was officially part of reef builders, but I, I was just helping a buddy out. And then of course the podcast, you know, he was like, Hey, could you commit to doing something once a week? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, so, so in a sense, I'm not, you know, I've, I've never been officially uh, on, you know, the payroll or, or had been part of the strategy or anything like that. So it ultimately really isn't up to me. Um, if they, uh, if they'll have me, I'll jump on and have a good time and drink a beer and, you know, <laughs> throw my opinions out there. Um, and, and, you know, maybe he wants to change it up where it's a different, different band of people every week, or I don't know, I don't know yet, you know, so We'll see. Uh, we'll see what Raj does with it. I'm really excited that he uh, that he took it over. I think he's got a lot of vision and he's he's got a lot of tenacity, right? He runs a successful business. Um, as much as we all love Jake, I think you know what it's clear. Raj recognized one weakness in reef builders was that a lot of the weight of reef builders was on Jake. And I'm not trying to diminish what Evan. And Jeremy and everybody else did. They did a lot of work. But, you know, when we think of reef builders, we think of Jake. You know, he was the face. And um, but that also was sort of, a um, you know, a problem when he passed away, I think. And so seeing him bring all these great people on board, uh, I mean, all of my heroes, right, people mm -hmm. I look up to are now part of the reef builders crew. I think that's that's really good. I think that, it, you know, and, and it also the thing about Jake is he was very opinionated. And, uh, some people agreed with him, some people didn't, uh, but you know, a lot of people I met that disagreed with him still respected him. But I think, uh, with this new, uh, you know, crew, there's somebody for everybody. You know what I mean? You may not agree with one of the contributors or like their ideology on things, but you'll like the other guy. And so I think the diversity of contributors and, and their approaches and their thoughts on things is going to be really good. So. Well, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of people, but I hope we uh, we see you as part of that uh, crew in terms of on the um, you know the YouTube presence of Reef Builders moving forward. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I hope I can uh, contribute you know in some way in the future. Um, so we'll see. I think it's still early times, you know. So um, and I think I owe a lot of people an apology because when Jake passed, I, you know, I, the right thing for me to have done is done a, a re-therapy and just kind of put myself out there and, and, and talk about, you know, uh, not just what happened, but also kind of where things are. But I, I'll be honest, I was kind of in a, you know, where my head was, I wasn't sure it, you know, part of me, the immediate thought I had was, uh, there is no reef therapy without Jake. You know, there's no yeah. point in continuing this, but I also understood the reef builders perspective of, you know, they're trying to, they have they have sponsors. They have to keep things going. Um, so uh, yeah, and then you know they did ask me to come on for at least one last episode, but I was I was traveling for work and I was all over the place and I didn't respond in time. And I think they said, okay, well we got to put something out there. So I, I am sorry about that. I think I could have handled that better. Um, well, but, dude, I don't think any apologies are necessary. I think um, considering what went down, it's uh, totally understandable to kind of like just 
to, to stand back a little bit and, um, you know, let uh, things sink in and, and then react that way versus kind of spontaneously reacting. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, um, that's very, very kind of you to say, but probably, um, something that you don't need to apologize for, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a lot to process. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Especially for you. Yeah. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for that super chat. So nice to hear Mark again. I keep listening to older reef therapy in the car. Miss you and Jake. Hope you are doing well. Um, 1982, Joe Sell. Welcome back, Mark. We missed the reef therapy. Um, Salty Dead is reef builders going to auction frags. I think that is going to be happening down the road from what I understand. I don't know if you know anything about that. Um, Mark. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm not sure. I know they did some at the Reefstock show, but I had I thought they were planning on doing an online one as well. Yeah, uh, I just don't know when uh, that's happening. Um, Bert Minshew. All right, honest comment here. Personally, I'm not liking the marketing side of this endeavor. Okay, fair enough. Grassy Peak. No apologies necessary, man. You did it right! Exclamation point. Um, Thanks. blue reef, Mark, nothing but a classy, uh, this guy, um, <laughs> John kid, a hundred percent Keith, perfect response. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, um, uh, yeah, Barry Goss senior, everyone understands because we all mourn and cry in different ways. You did what you, your heart needed. Follow your heart for sure. I appreciate that. Um, did you guys ever like get to the point on reef therapy where you're like, man, we're kind of like running out of things to say. It's, I mean, knowing, you know, what Jake was all about, that probably would be kind of hard to fathom. But did you guys ever get to that point? Where like, man, we keep yeah. doing this every week? Well, we we struggled. It was interesting because uh, it was always an unfounded panic that we would have because <laughs> uh, we would take turns coming up with topics. And, you know, there came a point where because we wanted to keep it creative and non-standard and not the usual fare that you find out there. You know, if we were going to talk about protein skimmers, we, we wanted it to be a different topic or or approach to the discussion. So there'd always be this panic, like, dude, uh, after 50 or so episodes, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> but then every time we always laughed after we finished recording, because we'd be like, who would have thought we could have spent that much time talking about, well, protein skimmers, for example, or algae or, or, you know, anything. And it's because I don't know, there's this energy that always, I, he would say something that would get my brain worrying. And then my, I would say something that would get his brain going. And so it was, it was, uh, it, it just happened. You know what I mean? It, it, it's like, uh, in the end we realized like you could just be like, all right, talk about cell phones for two hours. And then, you know, Jake and I would just end up going down <laughs> some crazy rabbit hole for two hours. And we're like, how the hell did we do that? So, um, so yeah, we did worry, but, uh, we did have, uh, we did seem to always, uh, rescue it <laughs> in the moment, I guess would be the way to put it. So, yeah. You guys figured out a way. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, and, and, you know, he was headed to Bali. So, uh, for that, you know, trip. And I thought, oh, this would be great. He'll, he's going to come back, you know, energized with a million things he wants to talk about. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, here we go. We don't have to worry for like the next month or two. So, <laughs> but yeah. So you mentioned, um, before that, you know, not everyone agreed with what Jake's, uh, you know, certain theories and all that stuff. <clears throat> And, and, um, yeah, I mean, there was some stuff that he, 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 he believed in that I, I didn't believe in, but w was there stuff that you kind of like were firmly opposite him in terms yeah. of what he, uh, sand bed versus bare bottom? Was that one of them? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, it, it, you know, he, he was very reductionist and like, oh, you don't need that. Or, oh, that's, you know, that comes with these annoyances where I was like, well, yeah, but I'm trying to build something that is aesthetically pleasing that I like, you know? So, uh, I have nothing against bare bottoms and I actually don't like sugar sand anymore either. So if, if he was still alive, that, I, you know, I have run into these moments where I'm like, ah, I want to tell him something, you know? And, and one thing is that, you know, forget sugar size sand. I'm, I'm fully on board with the crushed coral now, you know? So, but, um, he also kind of crapped on, uh, cheap gear 
and something about magnets wearing out. And I, I don't know anything about magnets, but, you know, I, I always disagreed with him on that a little bit because I thought, yeah, I mean, I, I use good pumps and stuff too, but if some guy's going to buy a J-Bow or G-Bow pump, you know, and it's 80 bucks versus 300 bucks, and it only lasts 24 months, I'm not... I don't like disposable goods. I don't want to fill up our landfills with a bunch of crap. But, you know, <laughs> people have budgets and I, there's people running Jibo pumps for years, you know, and I, I don't know. I I don't I thought that his whole thing about magnets becoming less efficient was a little bit uh, overblown and it didn't quite make sense to me. Um, uh, why would they use different magnets? And I, I don't know. I could be way wrong about that. He could be right about it. Um, and then. uh I'm a fish guy. He was a coral guy. I mean, I'm a coral guy, but I'll, I'll sacrifice corals for the, you know, if it means I can keep a certain type of fish. So we never agreed on that. Um, there's a lot, there's a long list of things we didn't agree on. I love refugiums. Hmm. Um, yeah, I just, in my experience, I can't explain it. If I throw a light on the sump and I grow some Cato or I, even Calerpa back in the day, Calerpa taxifolia and racemose and all that, it's just, the tank locks in for me and I have less problems. I have less cyano issues. I have things just seem to jive more. And so I was always a fan about, you know, refugiums where he just thought, well, now you're in the business of growing algae, you know, like now you have more work to do. And <laughs> so, um, yeah. So yeah, we didn't see, I, but, but, you know, that was the great thing is that we respected each other and we could disagree and agree to disagree. Um, and, you know, as polarizing as he could have been with his strong opinions at times, everyone that knew him knew that he actually, there's people who have strong opinions that you can't change their mind on anything. They're, they, so they're, they have strong opinions, but they're stubborn. But he didn't have that stubbornness. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, brag about it or anything, but there are times where he's called me and been like, you know, I thought about what you said and you're right, you know, like a million <laughs> times. And it's just, he, you could change his mind, you know, you could, uh, you could offer up an alternating opinion and make him see that, oh, yeah, okay, maybe that's that's true and this is false. Or, so it's just that he he would come at you strong. So I think someone who's a bit, you know, gun shy about throwing his opinion into the hat might be like, oh, this guy, you know, this guy's really passionate about his opinion. So Yeah. Um, I see we have both uh, Chris and Amanda Meckley in the chat. What's, what's happened there, folks? Um, Chris, uh, how's it going, Keith and Mark? And uh, Amanda says, uh, it's nice to hear the stories about Jake. We miss him. Um, yeah, Mark, what, uh, so I know I asked you this question, you know, nine months ago when I had you on initially on the, on the uh, live stream in terms of how you guys actually met, um, you know, so maybe you could repeat that story. And, and then maybe after that yeah. story, you could give us like one of your favorite stories about Jake. Oh, you want good ones or bad ones? I think the best part about reef stock is that we all had, you know, oh, remember when he did this? You know, like we, like uh, we, we all had um, funny stories about him too, right? So, no, um, so when I was in college, I, I went to college thinking I wanted to be a marine biologist. You know, that was the dream. I was the kid watching Jacques Cousteau videos on on uh, TV and, you know, I like, I mean, obviously if you age me, I'm 45. So if I had my first re uh, saltwater tank in 92, you know, I, I, I was doing this at a pretty young age yeah. and I was pretty obsessed at a young age. So when it came to go to college and, oh, what's your major going to be? It's just, oh, well, what am I passionate about? You know, I'm passionate about marine biology. Um, so I went to go get my degree. Um, then I realized I was going to have a crap ton of student loans <laughs> to pay <laughs> off. And uh, I was doing a research project. And the guy I was doing the project with, he was getting his master's. And uh, he had a degree. And he had done, he had been working as a marine biologist in the Florida Keys. But he was waiting tables at night to pay the bills. And so I started to think, how am I going to pay these student loans <laughs> off? Um, and uh, I had a brother who, you know, it was the dot com boom when yep. I was in college, and he was working in IT. And he was like, "Yeah, you know, take some computer science classes, get an IT job, and then you can um, pay off some of those loans before you go get your master's." Which is bad because once you start to make more money than a marine mm -hmm. biologist would, why would you go back to school <laughs> to become a marine biologist? <laughs> Anyway, so I had my reef tank in college, and I uh, would venture down to Denver because Boulder. 
the Boulder Aquarium stores were, you know, some were good, but they're better. There were better ones down in Denver, in my opinion. I don't want to offend anybody <laughs> that was running a store back then. Um, and there was this punky kid working at the store, very opinionated, you know, uh, telling me what I, <laughs> everything I was doing wrong. And he knew a lot more than I did. You know, I was, um, I was keeping LPS softies and I never kept any SPS and, uh, a bunch of uh, corals from the Solomon islands came in from Bob Mankin. And, uh, I was like, man, those are really cool. And, he, and, uh, but they were, you know, expensive for a college student, yeah. but um, like any shipments of coral, little branches had broken off. And he's like, well, here, you can have these for free. And I was like, well, what do I do with these? And he gave me this stick of super glue. And he's like, go home, glue it on a rock and, you know, let it grow. And so, you know, I did that. And then, of course, I realized my power compacts were not great for SPS. So the next thing you know, I'm putting a Iwasaki over this 20-inch tank with giant computer fans. And the SPS journey started. Um, but then I'd go down every once in a while and visit him at the store. And it was a fun store that he ran uh, or he worked there. You know, they'd have barbecues and a keg of beer outside, sometimes in the parking nice. lot. And yeah, and I learned a lot. And um, then it was time to graduate. And I moved to Atlanta where my brother was living and he was going to help. You know, he had some good recommendations on how to get a job in the IT world. And I brought my reef aquarium. It was a... 30 inch by 20 inch cube, I think 24 inch oh. cube. Anyway, I, I stuck it in a U-Haul. I drove it to Atlanta and then I was like, Oh, I'm going to go check out the reef stores in Atlanta. And I walk into the first reef store and the same punky kid is sitting behind the <laughs> counter. And he looked at me and I looked at him. We're like, what the hell are you doing here? Um, turns out the guy that owned the uh, one guy owned both stores, the Denver and the Atlanta location. He had asked Jake to come to Atlanta and manage the store just happenstance at the same time I've moved to Atlanta. So then we started hanging out more because we both didn't know a lot of people in Atlanta. And um, and then uh, I remember he was over at the house. We were drinking beers. Um, I think he was only 17 years old at the time <laughs> or 18. And I thought he was in his 20s. You know, I mean, he just <laughs> he looked old. Yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought he was my age. And um, and he mentioned that, you know, he, he was thinking about going to college, but he wasn't sure. And I was probably three or four beers deep. And I was like, dude, <laughs> it, you know, you ever give advice to somebody that you you just didn't think stuck? You're just like, ah, you know, here's my opinion. Take it or leave it. And then later you find out that you said something that really influenced them. And you're like, really? Like I was <laughs> He took, he took that advice to heart, huh? <laughs> yeah. So I said, you know, with all the knowledge you have, the, you know, the fact that you obsess so much over the taxonomy that, you know, you live and breathe this stuff. Like, you know, I thought I was crazy, but like you're on a different level. And I said, it'd be a waste if you didn't pursue it further than just, you know, working at a local fish store. And I, I totally forgot I said that. And we had lost touch for about two years. Um, I was bouncing around apartments and then I bought a house and I, you know, took a while to get back into reef keeping because I was, I didn't want to move a tank constantly. Yeah. And so I finally set one up at my, you know, when we bought a house and I reached out to him. I said, hey, guess what? I got a reef tank going again. And, you know, we're only talking about two years there, 24 months. And he's like, oh, I'm in Columbia now. I'm at the University of South Carolina. Come visit me, you know, because that was only a two hour, three hour drive. So I drove up there and that's when he told me, he's like, you remember that day in the apartment where we were, you know, and you said that and he's like, I couldn't sleep and I thought about it. And I was like, holy crap, I actually <laughs> gave somebody good advice. <laughs> I never give anybody good advice. <laughs> Um, and so then the friendship continued and, you know, as saw him try to do like a coral idea, it was like a coral identification site. You could see him starting to formulate this journey of where he eventually became the, the reef builders guy. So, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's sort of how that developed. And, um, and I think, you know, he, I mean, he was friends with people that were our heroes. You know, I always joke, like I was a little kid in middle school with my fama magazine, always going to. Julian Sprung's reef notes and he was like a legend to me and then you know fast forward and Jake's like oh you know I was over at Julian's house and we were chatting about but I'm like you know Julian Sprung you know <laughs> so he you know he's hobnobbing with like our childhood heroes and uh you know but I think he still just loved chatting it up with me because we had that history we were like we were both the youngins and you'd go to a Macna I went to a Macna in 2000 and you know there's all your there's there's all the heroes right there's all the guys whose books and stuff you read i met peter wilkins there yeah. 
um, legend, right? Um, and, uh, you know, but, but there weren't a lot of us young guys hanging out. It, and you, you know this, the hobby was a lot smaller back then. So yes. I, I think us young runs kind of stuck together. And then next thing you know, we're the old runs. <laughs> you know, we're the 40-somethings. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, as far as stories, I don't know. I got a, man, I got a million. Um, Which one sticks out in your mind? Oh, man. Um, so he, he had this amazing thing of bringing us all together. Um, uh, I, you and in, you interviewed Vincent, Ch- uh, Chalet. Yeah. I hope I'm saying his last name wrong. I always want to Frenchify it <laughs> more. Uh, but, uh, I, um, before the Fort Lauderdale magnet, I don't know what year that was, but he called me up and he said, Hey, here's the deal. Um, there's this guy from Bali. He's going to land in Atlanta and he needs a place to stay. He's going to stay at your house <laughs> and, uh, you know, just show him, show him around, show him a good time, you know, cause he's, uh, he's one of the guys that's going to be at Macna doing a talk. Never met Vincent in my entire life. So all the, you know, and, and, you know, the thing about strangers, like I had, I had a, I had a young daughter. I'm like some strange guys coming into my house. Who is this guy? But, but he would do that. He would, there, there was no asking with him. You know, he was like, Hey, I need you to do this. Hey, you know, and <laughs> I'm like, yeah, all right, man. So there I am at the uh, terminal at the airport waiting for some guy I've never met to show up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously you've met Vincent, uh, you've talked to him. He's fantastic. Dude shows up. We have a great time. We, he's, he was really into ultra trail running, like, like ultra oh, marathon yeah. trail stuff. So I was like, all right, I'll take you hiking. You know, I, I can't run, but I'll hike. I mean, I, I do like to run, but not not the way he yeah. runs. Uh, we went to the George Aquarium. We went out for beers. And next thing you know, I had this, I was like, oh, now I have a friend from Bali that I know well and I'm really good friends with. And uh, and then we went together for Lauderdale. But but he just had that effect of bringing people together like that. Um, and shout out to Vincent, you know, somewhere along the line, hanging out at the house, I had talked about how, uh, one of my obsessive corals that I was trying to track down was an orange herpeletha, you know, like a tongue coral uh-huh. in orange. Forgot I told him that. And then all of a sudden I got a call, I don't know, probably half a year later, maybe less, uh, from Unique Corals. And they said, hey, we have a, del- a shipment for you from Vincent. <laughs> and next thing you know, this orange herpeletha, beautiful, shows up on my doorstep. I still have it, you know. So I, that's the thing about Jake. He kind of had that kind of pull people together and create these opportunities and these, uh, friendships, you know? Yeah. That's, that's not a surprise to hear that, you know, he, um, he, he was a, um, you know, a very, he, he was, he was, um, not shy about, uh, I think anything. And, and so it, um, it, it's not surprising to hear that, um, he, uh, he made, he, he made those, uh, kind of requests. I guess they weren't requests. I guess they were just kind of like, this is yeah. what, this is, this is what's going to be going down you know, in terms of, yeah. um, how it's going to play out. But, um, yeah, not a surprise. Um, a couple more, uh, comments, uh, Mark Hibbard, great story. I think there are a lot of, uh, this is back to your story, uh, about, um, being a, um, a marine uh, biologist. Great story. I think there are a lot of reef hobbyists that have wanted to be a marine biologist 30 years later, making more in another field, spending a bundle on a hobby exclamation yeah. point. <laughs> yeah yeah it's a it's not a cheap hobby um amanda so. meckley so true he connected so many of us um big heart and uh chris at aci he loved orange herps yeah chris and amanda after jake's passing uh they were great they reached out to me and uh i'd never spoken to either of them and next thing you know, I, you know, like I remember Chris and I had like a three hour long conversation <laughs> and, um, and it, it's interesting cause Jake had a really good relationship with Chris and, you know, they went down the rabbit hole all the time talking about stuff. And so, and he, Jake was trying to get Chris and I to, again, you know, like in terms of bringing people together, he's like, Oh, he would always tell me like, you got to talk to Chris. You would love talking to Chris. And apparently he was saying the same to Chris and, so, you know, we, we finally made it happen. Unfortunately, it was after Jake passed. I think he would love to seeing us chatting it up, but, uh, I, they've been really great. And, uh, you know, at a time where I was like, well, who do I call about, you know, when I'd have a random thought about something and, and they were there for me for that. So, uh, big thanks to them. Yeah, no, the Meckleys are great. And, um, yeah, I, I think, um, 
you know, Chris and Jake were, uh, were very, very, very close, you know, as, as well. So it, um, you know, that, that was another uh, special relationship that, uh, that Jake had. And I'm sure there was, um, plenty of those types yeah. of relationships out there for sure. Um, all right. What, um, there was a question back earlier in the chat. I can't remember who, uh, who had asked this question. And I think, um, the question was, um, what was one of your favorite corals that, um, that Jake, um, you know, passed along to you? I have two, um, and they're boring corals to most people, but we've been passing it back and forth between each other, um, since the beginning, since he was at Columbia, South Carolina for college. Uh, and one is a, a candy cane, man. He came up with a cool trade name for it recently or, uh, a little while back. Uh, it was like star mints or star something. Chris will know. Um, uh, but that, that candy cane, uh, Calastria has, was, you know, I'd have it, then he'd have it, then I'd have it. And I mean, I, I think I've kept that coral in one tank or another forever. And then there's just this standard form green hammer coral, green branching hammer, like you've seen since the dawn of time that again, he gave me a frag of, uh, when I was restarting my tank after, uh, that brief hiatus and I've, I've actually tried to get rid of it a few times by hacking it back. And, you know, I, I think the reef therapy people, people know that again, the habit of just throwing it in the yard. So I have like a, a pile of dead skeletons in my backyard because it's just always a pain to try to find people local. I don't, I mean, I just don't know a lot of local people to trade with. And, um, anyway, it's the most, I don't want to, I, I know I used the word tenacious earlier to talk about, uh, Raj in a complimentary way, but, uh, this coral's tenacious in a bad way. Like I, I started to have reactions to hammer corals. So I was like, I don't want this thing in my tank anymore. Every time I brush against it, I have a, a rash on my hand, but I would hack it back and it would just show up somewhere else in my tank. <laughs> and so eventually I was like, all right, you win, you know, I mean, you, you earned your right to stay. Um, but and it's funny because I I text Jake sometimes because he goes through like he goes through you know different corals and he would move around before the studio, and it, you know uh, when he set up the studio I was like hey you remember this candy cane I still have it man he's like I need that I don't have that anymore, <laughs> and then you know he's got all these rare hammer corals and I'm like hey remember this hammer that you gave me back in you know the South Carolina days he's like I need that I don't have a frag of that and so. I always laugh because here I am shipping these boring common corals to the reef builder studio, <laughs> but he understood the sentimentality of these corals that have a story, right? So star mint, there it is. Yes, <laughs> yeah, Chris, star mint is slow growing for me. That's what, uh, he can have some of mine go, if he wants. <laughs> so, all right. I think we're getting some calls now. Um, Mark, to uh, to talk about your tank, I see uh, sure. Ryan felt. Let's see Mark's tank and um, Trevor Hiller. I'd love to hear Mark describe his tank. I think we could all learn a lot of equipment methodology, et cetera. So let's. Um, so you sent me some video mm -hmm. of um, how many gallons is this tank? I'm going to start to, uh, to show the uh, the video. It, it's like a standard 180 dimension, so six by two by yep. two. Um, but I had them cut the overflow corner overflow lower, so it's a little less water volume than a standard 180. Because uh, I think I got about a four inch rim on it. Um, and yeah, like I told you, and you know, before we started this, uh, you caught me when I was kind of going through a reboot because I I was very softy focused in that tank, and then I ripped out all these huge soft corals, and I had started you know, watching different coral vendors with stuff pop up. And I started collecting frags of some things that I liked and all that I'm sure people can relate sits on a frag rack far too long, you know, cause you got to get off your butt and actually glue yes. that stuff down. Why is that so hard? So, I don't know why that, that is I know. so freaking hard sometimes. It's easy to buy it. Right. <laughs> but then you get it and you're like, Oh, now I got to do something with it. But, uh, so I finally got off my butt and uh, ripped out a bunch of soft corals and mounted a bunch of frags. So it's it's kind of in a a reboot. And then you'll probably see a fish trap on the left because as we talked at Reef Stock, um, I'm starting to wonder if the Regal is doing more than I think mm. he is because I started to have problems with um, my chalice a little bit. 
and and then any frag of a chalice really struggled. The big ones did okay, and uh, I thought, you know, why am I having problems with chalice corals all of a sudden? So I did all the ICP tests and you know, looking at every pump and seeing if there's any rust or anything going on, and not, you know, nothing popped up. And then I started to wonder, you know, maybe that little dude's just pecking away. So I was gonna trap him and uh, put him in my refugium for two or three weeks and just see if there's a notable change with the corals, you know. And if there is, then I know that he's, you know, he's not devouring them, but he's just pecking at them and irritating them. And and that'll be sad if that's true because he's my, you know, I always love angels. Uh, but he might have to might have to go. <laughs> so you didn't you haven't really caught him in the act yet. No, I mean he's always uh, picking. You know, he's always pecking around. But it's hard to say if he's actually doing any. Uh, it, he's, there's not like chunks missing, you know. But I just wonder if he's just irritating things. So uh, oh, there you go, unorthodox. Yeah, it's uh, yeah the edges exactly like what he's saying. It's the edges were starting to get recession. And uh, I thought it was a water quality issue, to be honest. But then I thought, well, why are all these other corals doing okay? And he's a weird fish because I have uh, blastos in there. And you'd think that would yeah. be like candy for a regal. He doesn't touch him. Um, so, and then I've got a 60 breeder in the basement that's sort of the kitchen sink of where I keep things I think he would like to eat. Because I really love LPS corals. So I have a bunch of trackies and... Uh, what else do I have in there? Um, a bubble coral. But, you know, so I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe I move all of those LPS I love so much to my bigger tank and then put the little Regal in the 60, which is way too small for him. But uh, he's a little guy. He's only three inches. So I could keep him maybe a little longer before I have to rehome him. Start that SPS dominant tank. <laughs> <laughs> I did put some SPS in for you. <laughs> Uh, nothing too crazy or expensive, but I, I picked up uh, now, a tort and stuff. So, listen, yeah. that's like that's no guarantee. I mean, I, I think as we talked about at uh, at Restock, I had this gorgeous, gorgeous um, biota misbarred uh, regal angelfish that was like, you know, two inches uh, long. Maybe it was three inches, but I was just so I mean, that's like for me, the holy grail fish. I've got I've got a yeah. um, I've got a, um, a wild caught. Miss Bar Regal in my peninsula tank. And, you know, every now and then he'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll see like a colony where the polyps on, on the acros are, are like, um, you know, closed up. And I'm like, all right, he's been at it. But, you know, then an hour later, the uh, the polyps are back out and he, you know, he's picking around, picking around. But I had this uh, this gorgeous um, Miss Bar <clears throat> that um, I picked up from a hobbyist at the uh, New York Reef of Palooza this past June. So I had okay, him in, yeah. uh, in a frag tank full of SPS frags, but <clears throat> he pretty much spent the entire, you know, three or four months that I had him in that tank underneath the frag racks. So he was just not mm -hmm. um, venturing out at all, I guess, to, to the top of the racks. I had a couple of the fish, you know, in that tank. There was a, um, still, still are a fox face and a um, yellow tang in that tank. So, you know, they're bigger than him. So he was probably just a little uh, nervous about it. Anyway, you know, so I, I did the reboot on my 187 gallon display tank and I planted a whole bunch of frags <clears throat> and I'm like, I'm moving this dude in that tank. He's going to be like the, my centerpiece fish in this, uh, yeah. in this fish tank. And you know, first week fine. Then like week two, I'm like, why are all my SPS frags completely closed up? I mean, I, <laughs> completely. I was like, what, what is going on? And so I just kind of sat back and looked and watched how he just picked and picked and picked. I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. Oh, yeah. What a bummer. What a bummer. So I had to, um, I actually put a fish trap in, in the, uh, the tank and I was, you know, assuming that it would take a while to kind of get him or her used to that trap. I actually caught in 15 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's it was, good. Um, I was completely, because it, it, it actually wasn't a, a real fish trap. It was a um, an acclimation box, like a fish acclimation box. And it's got okay, a, yeah, um, yeah. you know, like a plastic door on it, which I tied with, uh, you know, fishing line to it. And um, I put some food in there just to kind of test it out. And the thing wandered in there. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> close the door. I was like, holy smokes. I got, you know, so I was like very, very lucky. But 
Yeah, fish traps are are worth their weight in gold, uh, or any type of you know that works. I, I use a bubble magus one that I think uh, you can get a bulk resupply, I think, and you know it just has a little stri- uh, fishing line that you pull, and a little tab comes out, and then the you know the garage door or whatever you call it just comes flying down. Um, but yeah, it's he's swam in there a few times when I'm sitting there, and so I I know I'll be able to catch him because I've been feeding through the box so all the fish are now associating yeah. it as the feeding place but i'm it's it's horrible to admit i'm i'm still hemming and hawing because i love that fish so much i'm like well maybe or maybe i just move the chalices out and you know but i am just worried uh you know that i'm making a lot of compromises for one fish and so you, yeah you've had regals before in the past right yeah, I had one for, gosh, like more than five years, probably six or seven years. Uh, I don't, I'm not good with dates, but he was, um, he was a surprise uh, survivor because he came in much bigger than I was anticipating, and I've always thought large regals are hard to adapt. And it took me about two months of getting clams at Whole Foods. Fresh <laughs> clams was pricey. <laughs> Um, and then eventually, you know, the trick where you save all the shells, but you freeze fish food into the shells. And, uh, and so I, that's how I kept him fed for a while. And then one day his brain just clicked where he thought, Hey, I can actually eat stuff out of the water column too. Um, and then I kept that fish for a very, very long time, relatively speaking until I had a, um, a mishap with a heater. But, uh, yeah, I had, uh, I, and that's what I was trying to bring back as I, I just sat around and thought, man, I miss that fish. I want another one. And then this one, the other reason I have a hard time getting rid of this, this one came from uh, Matt at TSM who, you know, passed away. And uh, yes. he and I kind of had some good communication back and forth about this fish. And it literally showed up and I was, um, I had it acclimating and I, he just was swimming around and I threw just a couple of little pellets in there and he was eating in the bag. Oh, wow. I thought, you know, dry pellet food. I thought this is can't that's, ask for more out of a. That's regal. an awesome song. And this, yeah, and then I'm, I know this days they're captive bred, so maybe that's par for the course. But back in the day, that was that's rare. Uh, you had to, yeah. Um, just a little housekeeping, folks. I'm I'm kind of getting some um, feedback from YouTube that the stream might be um, not smooth. If if um, if there's any issues, just drop a note for me in the chat. But um, it seems like we're doing okay. But I'm I'm kind of getting a uh, a warning about the um, potential buffering of this uh, live stream. Hopefully we're uh, we're good here, Mark. I think uh, I guess th- this is the uh, this is what happens with the with a live stream. But uh, I've never seen this kind of error before, so I guess there's always time for a first. Yeah, I'm looking at myself because uh, I was keeping the live chat up and I see myself talking over there when I'm not talking. So maybe it's just a few seconds delayed or something. That's great so far. All right. Yeah, it buffered once. Okay, thanks. Five seconds. Yeah, it looked like it buffered when I showed the uh, video. So speaking of the video, man, um, we, 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 we talked about this via text. I noticed a blue uh, squamosa clam. Talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, that was... Uh, so, uh, you know, Macna was supposed to happen in Atlanta. Then, the, you know, we all know COVID happened and um, Macna changed to be the Aquatic Expo and then they moved Macna to Milwaukee. Um, so Jake asked, you know, hey, I'd like to do a reef therapy at the Aquatic Expo, which I didn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, I said, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, but uh, so he showed up and... Um, it was funny because, uh, you know, he showed up to buy corals and, and he he kept buying me stuff without telling me. <laughs> and so um, and it was funny because at one point, um, you know, I think he had a laugh because I saw this obscure f- coral that had been, you know, they had a bunch of frags of. It was a it was just a, a weird looking micromusa that they had a bunch of frags of. And I bought one. And he came over, he's like, I bought you this really cool Micromusa. I'm like, I bought, I just bought that five <laughs> minutes ago. He's like, dang it, you know, but it just showed that we had the same eye for things. Um, but then he was like, hey, walk with me. And he's like, you know, I bought you that. And he's like, I bought you that coral. And I, I bought you that clam. And it was that blue. Was he, was he using spotted. your credit card? <laughs> no, no. Um, but like I said, I was never on the reef builders payroll and, and, and not, not, I mean, they, you know, Jake offered, hey, you know, can we pay you or something? I said, you know. 
was like, I, I, all I got to do is show up and drink a beer, you know, and chat. I, you don't need to pay me for that. I'm having fun. Um, plus, then I got to tell my work I have another job. Yeah, and, you know, it's complicated. I, I work, yeah, the comp type of business I'm in, I have to report everything. <laughs> So I was like, yeah, it's just, that's a headache, you know? He's like, oh, all right. So to just thank me for doing the chat with him at the expo, he's like, I'm going to buy you some corals, you know, just to say thanks. So he bought me that clam and, you know, that was a year ago. And it's, yeah, I have good luck with uh, ugly clams. Not that that one's ugly. It's beautiful. But, um, you know, squamosas, deraces, I have, I do pretty well with them. I actually had one squamosa years ago that outgrew my, my 180 that I had then and, uh, Luckily, I knew somebody at the Georgia Aquarium at the time, and they uh, they took it in, and they have like a lagoon above the whale, uh, no, above the coral reef exhibit with mangroves and stuff. And um, but I think since then they had a a clam disease breakout, and they had some issues with clams. So, but uh, blue squamosas, I I didn't have good luck with. I'm um, showing a picture of a uh, blue squamy that I that I had probably for a week <laughs> before yeah. before it like. <laughs> Started to uh, what the pinch mantle thing going on, and then man, oh, it was like, yeah. forget it, done. But that was like when Live Aquaria had, I think there were ORA clams mm-hmm. that, um, you know, for like 300, 350 bucks or something. You know, that's kind of like on my kind of on the cusp for me in terms of spending too much money on whatever. Oh, oh yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. and that, um, but I've seen some gorgeous blue squamies in person that were not captive rays that were like wild you know blue squamies that just were were gigantic and um you know flourished in, in a reef tank yeah i don't know if mine was wild or um or not or or from a farm or i mean probably not wild but uh, i don't know if it was from an ora farm or, or another farm but um yeah i had a blue squammy next to the duresa that you see in that picture uh and that was years ago i've had that derace a lot longer and it was like they're in the same spot under the same light and the derace you could see that white you know growth yes. on the right. shell so that that thing was growing bonkers and then just sort of like what happened to you the squammy just was withering away and there was no growth and then eventually it just died and i thought you know well what's what's going on they're 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 next to each other they have the same light. They have the same flow. I don't know. I, you know, what is it about blue clam, blue colored clams? Because you know, I don't. I, I've never had good luck with Maximas or Croceas either. Um, I, you know, I want to say I did long ago when we were doing halides. That's that's I wanna... when I was able to keep clams a long time yeah. ago under my halides, and um, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's happened. I don't know if it's, um, you know, there's a lot more captive rays, smaller clams out there in the market that are like one inch, one and a half inches that um, just don't have the, um, you know, are not resilient enough to, to, to make that transition into another system. Or maybe there's some specific requirements in terms of lighting and flow and, and um, you know, uh, nourishment. I don't know. But it just seems to me like... Yeah. This day and age, it's it's tougher for me at least to keep clams. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably I'm gonna totally talk out of my ass here, but I wondered, you know, our LEDs are so much as a par from our LEDs are coming from blue LEDs, right? The 450 nanometer range and all that, and then you know you've got a couple of you know whites, cool whites in there, and given that what you're seeing on that clam is all the blue reflecting back at you. I, I, I've thought, you know, or I've wondered, um, are, is it because they're reflecting back the spectrums that have the most par and then the other areas of the spectrum where you're getting more into the cyans and reds and stuff, there's not enough par in that department for a clam, but that's me talking out of my butt. I don't know. You know, whereas the halides, you know, especially Iwasaki's and the Ushio's and all that, they, you know, you were you were hammering them with par all across, but I just kind of wonder if, you know, you, all these LED lights have you know eighty percent blue royal blue, and then they got like a couple of token greens and reds and whites, and maybe uh, maybe it's just uh, we we our par meter says, hey, look at all this par this clam's having, but it's all in the 
department that they're reflecting back yeah. to you and showing you all that beautiful blue back but i have no idea we're um, getting uh, some comments that that uv potentially could be a part of that equation um and Meckley, guess what our clams are under um metal halides is um <laughs> Perry Goss senior metal halides um bert Minshew, there is probably a uv requirement to some extent for maximums i believe um yeah amanda Meckley. oh boy yeah the light discussion that's uh, thank you, uh, Larry and Niranet, for the uh, for the super chat. Thanks, Keith and Mark. Love this chat. Um, thank you, uh, Piotra. I'm I'm probably mispronouncing that for the super chat. I might be. I wonder if that's Peter in in. Uh, I, I I don't know if it's Russian or Polish. Okay. Or, I could be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you're yeah. You you would you would probably have a better idea than myself. Cheers, fellas. Thank you very much. Uh, if it's Peter, Peter. Um, Rob B's Reef. Crossing my fingers, I had my maximum for eight months now. Seems to be doing well. Do you remember uh, this type of uh, clam bark? It's going to probably come up in about 20 seconds. A um, a teardrop clam. Oh, yeah. These were just sick. These uh, these blue teardrops. There was also like gold teardrops out there. And um, so I had um, I had success with teardrops back in the day. A couple of um, a couple of them. I'll show uh, I'll show you a picture. I'm, I'm sorry. This is kind of like uh, digressing into uh, my uh, show and tell oh. in terms of clams and stuff like that. But um, here here was it. Wow, that's a nice. Here's one. a group of clams I had back in my old um, 225 gallon tank, and the the uh, the blue one in the back is this um, blue teardrop clam that I picked up from Reefer uh, Reefer's Madness. Did did you uh, ever shop at Reefers Madness online uh, back uh, back yeah. way back when? They had some sick sick clams for sale. Yeah, I, I um so I, I told you that story about Jake sending me home with some broken branches and super glue. Um, he also sent me home with, and it came from the Solomon Islands, uh, Australia Gyra, which is non-existent in the hobby. Um, and um, you know I. It, it didn't survive. It just sat there and didn't grow. And then one day on Reefer Madness, years later, uh, or, uh, maybe 2004, I don't know, I'm just pulling dates out of nowhere, but um, they had an Australia Ogyra on their site, and I just, I ordered it. Uh, they, they had weird corals show up. They had Halomitra. Uh, I had a, I ordered a Halomitra from them, and that thing just growed, grew. I mean, I know Sanjay's got one, I think, or maybe it's he's got Sandalitha. I'm not sure, but man, my Halimitra turned into a giant monster. I had to get rid of it. Um, but they, you know, they brought in that stuff that you, you don't see that anymore. No. Everything's torches or tenuous acros or, you know, like what what happened to the crazy weird stuff? You know, so um, so I gave uh, I I gave uh, Australia Jaya another shot. Had it under halides, and it just. Uh, and for those that don't know, it's like a branching favitis. Mm. It's it's pretty crazy, wow. but it's not very colorful. It's just green and brown, but it just didn't grow. It just sat there. Um, so it was rather unfortunate. Um, I'll, I'll, I don't want to keep killing corals, but if I ever saw another <laughs> one, I'd probably try again just because that's such a cool coral. But yeah, um, but that was a cool site. Uh, a lot of those, uh, there was... Was it Atlantis Aquarium or something out in California? Yes. That was another site I shopped yeah. at a lot, and they had really good acro frags. I remember um, Reefer Madness had these colonies that um, these Acropora yeah. humulus, like these purple oh, ones yeah. and these blue ones. I was like, man, those things are looking pretty awesome. And I, I you know, and and uh, you know, they came in as they you know looked on the website. There was no like uh, doctoring of the photos. I I didn't think at least in terms of what I saw on Reefer Reefer Madness and. I think today it's uh it can't be said for all uh, online vendors, but I thought it was pretty realistic in terms of what I was getting from uh, from Reaper Madness. But those guys were like the bomb. Yeah, if I ever did get back into SBS, uh, I talked to Jake about this. I I would uh, I would do a really high flow, low aquascape, and just go uh, with those gemniferas and and humulus and those those fat stubby reef crest acros uh that or i go uh just try to collect as many of the more deep water or bottle brush kinds um but yeah you don't see a lot of robust or not um 
uh, humulus or, or gemniferous no. or anything like no. that anymore. You know, um, Chris um, from ACS said, we just got branching Galaxia. Jake would be geeking out over it, and it's green, not brown. Ooh. Nice. Wow. I think I saw that picture on Facebook that he posted, yeah. Uh, Adam Moore, I read for Madness was Walt Smith soon um, in law. I'm sure uh, law or nephew. Oh, uh, Walt Smith's um, son-in-law or nephew. Okay. Oh, I didn't know Interesting. that. Uh, Rob of State, New York. Thanks, man, for that super chat. Really appreciate that super chat for a super chat, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, dude, let's uh, let's talk about um, you know your equipment setup and all that stuff. Has anything changed since we talked the last time? Have, have you um, do you experiment every now and then? Do you do you kind of like um, like to stick with what works, or have you kind of done some tinkering in the last uh, year or so? I have um, the most notable thing, and this is what you get when you talk with Chris all, a little too much, uh, is um, I, uh, so on the 60 breeder, you know, that's just sitting down here in the basement with a bunch of corals in it. Um, I, uh, I started to do, uh, calc dosing and chase and uh, pH. Fo- yeah. And so it's this, I, you know, I started to do this ideology of like, uh, and I don't want to put words in Chris's mouth, but the way I'm interpreting it is that, you know, we, we used to. You, I don't know if you recall it the same way, but back in the day, you were testing your calcium. And then when calcium reactors came around and we were like, well, how do you dial these things in? They were like, oh, well, here's the weird thing about calcium reactors. You got to dial in the alkalinity mm-hmm. and think of it as a alkalinity uh, reactor, not a calcium reactor. So all of a sudden you're testing alk, or at least this was for me how it went, right? And then all of a sudden you see this era where we're, chasing alk and we're trying to keep alk in a very strict range and uh but we're okay with letting ph bounce all over the place oh you know back in the when we all started doing calcium reactors and dumping a bunch of co2 in our tanks it was like oh yeah you know ph 7 9 7.9 and sometimes it goes up to this and that you know it goes up to eight don't worry about it and i i think that i mean that worked i i ran a calcium reactor when i was an sps nut and i didn't dose calc I didn't have CO2 scrubbers. I just looked at my pH and went, yeah, okay. Um, And I grew everything just fine. Um, But, you know, it's turning it on its head of, hey, raise your pH and keep that consistent with a lot less fluctuation. And then your out can be more fluctuating. Yes. Um, And uh, that seems to be more in line with the way things were back in the day where we we had decent pH before, you know, before the calcium reactors and all that. And I think, you know, metal halides, you know, were great pH generators. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did that. I just said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to tune my doser to dose enough calc to get my pH stable. And, you know, I'm not even at 8.3, 8.4, but I got it up to 8.2 and I'm able to keep it there. Uh, I think I can dose more because I still don't think I've matched my evaporate. Yep. Um, but I haven't tested alk in that tank in two months. Oh, really? Yeah. I shouldn't admit to that. <laughs> but um, And everything in the tank is, uh, I don't want to use the word happy because I know it's a coral, but uh, everything just looks phenomenal and everything's growing. And now it's my healing tank you know so when that stupid regal nips at stuff and i move it to the 60 breeder it just everything does well in it uh my uh my goniaporas are just huge polyp extension you know they're just out and about yeah. where the the actual skeleton's like a, a tiny marble but you know when it's out yeah. it looks like a the size of a softball um and so it's weird, uh, and I should probably test the alk on that. <laughs> but you know, I, I uh, as Chris just said it in his uh, in the chat, you know, it's like when people freak out about the alk that you know being too high. He's like, okay, what do your corals look happy? Yeah. You know, so I haven't made that switch on the big tank yet because um, I don't have an easy way to set up a big calc container. Uh, I could easily do a a uh, calc reactor, but, um, I don't have a way to do a large container. So I've actually been talking to Chris from, um, Captivate about, you know, maybe since I do a two part on that system, switching to a two part that 
has more of a potassium uh, and sodium chlorides. Is that the right word? Sodium, no carbonate or I don't know. I'm not a chemist, but um, basically a two part that's going to bump the pH a bit. And then if that doesn't work, maybe I'll start fiddling with a calc reactor, which I know uh, some of the folks don't have a lot of positive feeling on a calc reactors versus a calc container, but I just don't have a choice. Um, space issues. That, but yeah. That's what it is, space. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So uh, a calc reactor would be easy because I can definitely get as much RODI to it because I have that going through the wall from the basement. So I, I can feed as much DI water down into my stand area of the aquarium. I just need to figure out how to do that. But it was an interesting sort of development. And I even saw an article with Randy Holmes Farley, or maybe not an article, but a post where he sort of correlated the two and just talked about, you know, when you stabilize one, you might have more flexibility in the other. And I think, you know, when we dial in our ALK, and I, Randy might hear this and disagree with me, I'm, I may be misinterpreting him, but I got the impression that we we stabilize our ALK and the pH has a little variability, but if you have a more stable high pH, um, the exact value of your ALK, you know, whether it's 8 or whether it's 11 doesn't matter. And I don't know if you recall this, but we used to run our ALK a lot higher back in the day, and that was normal. Yeah, no, I, I, I never like was in the um, 11 to 12 dKH range. I know folks um, did do that and had success and, and like doing that. I've always kind of like tried to be in the 8 to 9 range, but I, I totally mm -hmm. agree with what you're saying in terms of the, um, you know, having the elevated pH and not worrying too much about the uh, variability in the alkalinity because that's what I'm experiencing, you know, and I, I'm doing, yeah. you know, the, uh, the Chris Me Meckley uh, method in terms of doing the Kalkwasser dosing in, in drums. And, um, you know, so I've got elevated pH in the eight, two to eight, four to eight, three to eight, five range in both of my systems. And yeah. Oh, that's good. And, um, you know, so sometimes my alkalinity will bounce from like, you know, nine down to the, to the low eights. And sometimes I'll get into the high sevens. Um, then sometimes it might just, uh, pop up to, to the low nines and, and what have you, but I have not noticed any ill effects in my acros when that stuff is bouncing yeah. around. And, and, you know, years ago I would have said, you know, stable alkalinity is like one of the most important things to have in a, in a reef tank. But, you know, I've, I've talked to a number of other folks on this live stream that just say, you know what, bouncing around with the alkalinity is not, uh, going to be a terrible you know, scenario and it's, it should not really have any impact on the corals. So I've kind of witnessed that firsthand. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think the ideal is you keep tabs on both. <laughs> so don't do what I do and not test your ALK for, you know, as long as I did. But, um, I, I think I, you know, I, I'll, I'm going to tell myself right now, I'm going to test it this weekend, but, uh, but I, you know, if, if you're gonna, you know, keep a hawk eye on one thing, I think maybe pH is the way to go. Um, and I've got a journey on the big tank cause that tank hovers around 7.9 to eight. So I've got to figure something out. I've got outside air going in. I've got, um, you know, like I'm dosing two parts, so I'm not dumping hmm. CO2 in it. So I don't, I don't, and my house, uh, CO2 is about, it fluctuates between five and 700 not, parts per bad. million. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, you know, so I've thought about putting, a uh, what you have, but down here in the South of the humidity, I'd have to do a, uh, what do you call it? A ventilating dehumidifier, which is sort of like an ERV or HRV, but it dehumidifies yeah, it first. Right. But then, you know, I don't know how much is that going to buy me, you know, cause that's, that's, a, those aren't cheap. And is it going to fix the problem or, you know, having 700, ppm of co2 maybe that's not really that bad you so. know for me it um adding the air exchange unit in my basement got me 0.2 ph points which was which was a big that's pretty big, good big jump you know so yeah. um and i run that thing pretty much all um you know mid fall until early spring because i got the window shut down in my basement so there's there's no circulation in terms of outside air coming in um you know yeah. normally with that air exchange unit, it's, um, it's recirculating outside to inside. And, and, you know, sometimes when it's super, super cold out, I can kind of feel the, uh, you know, see the temperature dip a little bit on the inside because it's bringing in that colder air. But even, uh, even with those extremes, it really hasn't been too much of an, uh, an issue. 
Yeah, I really want to get one eventually, just not just for the tank, but, you know, for my own sake, because we put a bunch of new windows in all throughout the house. And, uh, you know, I feel like uh, when you turn on the stove vent now, it's struggling to find air to evacuate, you know, so I think uh, having something like that create some positive pressure in the house beyond just helping the tank, I think would be good. Uh, Economical Reefer, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, please replay Reef Bum with uh, Chris Meckley and Jake Adams on PH. Love that video. <clears throat> I'm <not> sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I have to dig back in the archives, but I'm, I'm sure that was a uh, lengthy discussion. I think um, Chris Meckley, yeah, I, I, that's when I had, I think, both uh, Jake and Chris on at the same time. I was... I, I, I pretty much did not speak that whole uh, live stream. <laughs> I just kind of like sitting back watching those two dudes talk. <laughs> oh, man. I, I had that thought about because uh, hanging with Chris, uh, you know, after hours at the bar with everybody and chatting it up with him. And uh, I just thought, man, it, I wish because uh, I, I didn't really get to know Chris until after Jake passed. But I loved I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall more often between those two guys. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, Rob, New York, uh, Rob of senior, <clears throat> guess my old cellar windows are good for something. There you go. Letting the air inside. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I mean, I'm, it's nice having energy efficient windows. Uh, but I, I sort of almost regret it a little bit cause now I feel like I'm not getting any fresh air into the house. So, um, so. let me ask you another question about equipment and whatnot. Um, I picked up this algae scraper like a few weeks ago what's it called it's called a um algae free scraper it's got like you know an actual razor blade on it and i've oh, never yeah. used one of these things and let me tell you man <clears throat> this thing is like the bomb i feel i feel like I, yeah. I feel like i've been you know like a light bulb has finally been lit on top of my head in terms of scraping algae off the tank and I also started using a couple of years ago the uh, the flipper uh, magnet. Has there been anything for you yep. in terms of like just like a simple piece of equipment that was like a revelation? Like, wow, why didn't I find this thing sooner? Oh man, um, trying to think. Uh, I mean, I I didn't know that existed, and I like that it has rounded edges because what I've been using to scrape the back black, back glass is a paint scraper from Home Depot, and you can get replaceable blades for it. Yeah. But that has a really sharp 90 degree edge, and I've put some uh, some nice little scratches in the back of my tank with it. This has got so this has got I, like uh, square edges on it. I mean, it's it's a oh, razor it? blade. I think I got this from ChampionLighting.com. Oh no, that yeah okay, that looks like mine. Be careful with those. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if if you uh, if you're going on top of the acrylic, then it's gonna dig in. Yeah. Well, no, gla oh, even I, glass. I scrape my really? glass. Yeah, where if you're going straight and you're going gentle and you're not applying too much force, it's great. it'll take coralline off that off a back wall or whatever. Oh, okay. Really great. But if you kind of go sideways a little bit, those sharp edges, those 90 degrees dig in. And uh, I've got a few scratches that now have coralline growing in them mm. that I can't get out, right, because it's indented. So you see these weird squiggle lines on oh, the right. back glass. Good to know. Because I recommended that on a reef therapy, and then I, I felt so bad after that happened. I was like, oh, man, there's probably some guy out there that goes, that Mark He's cursing guy, you out. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I reneged. I did like a product recall on a future reef therapy. I was like, don't use that thing. You know, so, but if as long as you're careful with them, they're great. Um, I'm trying to think what else I, uh, I'm really loving. Uh, man. Um, I'm like brainstorming through all my equipment. Um, have you made any, oh, oh go ahead. I'm sorry. No. Uh, and I, I, um, do you remember Joe Berger? Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, uh, New York yeah. guy. He had a great SPSA. This is, I got this from him, but they, and I don't know who makes them, but I think bulk griefs probably sells it. Um, but it's this quick disconnect with these little tabs. And so my, um, my saltwater mixing station is in my basement directly below my tank. And uh, so when I want to do a big cleanup water change, um, I got to pump that water up. And so I have a hose connected to the biggest CJ that you can buy sitting in my saltwater mixing tub. And that uh, one-inch hose runs all the way up to my tank. And then it's mounted 
underneath the on the roof of my underside of my stand and uh i have a quick disconnect there this um man i'd, I'd have to pull it up on i think a reef builder sells it but it's just a two part and then the other part is attached to a hose with a you know a hook that hooks onto the rim of the tank for refill yep. and so it's great because i can hook up a python to the upstairs sink do my bit you know remove all the water i uh connect that disc quick disconnect to the the hose that you know has the has the u-shaped pvc that hangs on the rim of the tank and then i have an extension cord running all the way down to the ch uh that's plugged into one of those power strips that has an on off yep. button and then i just turn it on and it refills my tank from the basement and then i can disconnect it and what i love about that is because you can only f i used to do this with an old tank in the same position but i just had it fill the sump but you can only fill your sump up right. so much, and then you got to pump it into the right. display, and then you get the water level down, and then you fill it back up. So where, you know, it's like, man, it'd be really nice to just fill up the tank itself and then let it overflow down into the sump and when it's done. And so, um, yeah, I, that thing's been a lifesaver, and it's probably not very useful to most <laughs> people. But um, it's great to be able to run a pipe for a water change somewhere close to your tank and then just be able to connect a hose up to it and then it's just got these two metal tabs you flip and it's sealed with an o-ring so uh, that's the best answer i could come up with <laughs> no that's uh you know water changes in terms of making those simpler it's that that's that's that could be huge you know for yeah. sure you don't want to like have to you know do a bucket brigade or or what have you that's a pain in the ass so you you mentioned uh the basement you know um how long yeah. of a run is that from the basement up to the tank so it's directly below, um, but it's, you know, you got to fight gravity. Um, long ago, I had a basement. When I first moved into the house in 2010, I had a basement sump down there with a big um, blue line or what were the yellow pumps? Oh, yeah, uh, blue they were line. Sort of like a, I think yeah, you're talking yeah. about blue line, external pump. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I had that thing pumping That's all the way That's what I used up. to do. Uh, I had a blue line pump, yeah. external pump, pumping from a sump down in my uh, unfinished basement. To uh, my living room where I had my display tank. Okay, yep. yeah. Um, yeah, I did the same. Um, but it was always kind of weird having to run up and down the stairs when you're doing stuff to the tank. And so when I set up a 225, I said, okay, I want to have the sump inside the stand. And at that point, DC pumps had come out, DC skimmers, everything was quiet, you know, so there was no need to. The only, I mean, you, you know, get a good herbie overflow or bean animal like you can really keep noise down these days so i put the sump under the stand but then that created the problem i was like well all my rodi and my salt water is still down yeah. in the basement so i had to figure yeah. that out so but um and then yeah now this uh tank i have in the same spot i'm doing the same with and i like it that way just because i'm not using a whole lot of energy to run the tank 24 yeah. 7 uh, I'm really only using that big pump to pump against gravity when I'm doing a water have, change. Have, so the reason why I was asking about the run in terms of uh, the basement to the display tank, have you, have you uh, thought about, in terms of the caulkwasser drum, thought about trying to uh, draw caulk down from the basement up uh, upstairs via like a peristaltic pump? I have. And, and if I do it, that's the way I'm going to do it. But um uh, the, so when I bought my house, the basement was already finished by the previous homeowner and they finished, uh, 90% of the basement. So there was very little unfinished basements for storage. So here I am already taking up, you know, all this for an RO, uh, water vat, a saltwater mixing station above that. I got that 60 breeder then I got all, all this other stuff going on. And then, you know, where do you put the suitcases and the Christmas <laughs> ornaments? And uh, so, you know, then you have two kids and you got to store all their stuff and like childhood memory stuff. And so that space is really you. filling up and, you know, I can only get away with stealing so much space for my hobby. So. I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate because I've got my whole freaking basement to myself <clears throat> pretty much. You That's know? nice. So I could do it. I mean, I've, and I've done some pretty, crazy things to my basement in terms of, uh, you know, configuring things for my, my systems. And, and I've, I think I've used every square inch of my basement for <laughs> my, uh, fish tank systems. I've got like a little, um, tool, you know, like a little bench for, um, a workbench. 
and and uh-huh. uh, that's kind of squeezed into uh, you know the uh, the room with our uh, furnaces and and the uh, and the water heater and all that stuff. But yeah, um, I I uh, I am very fortunate in that in that regard to have a lot of um, my own personal space to to do this crazy hobby of ours and and um yeah i mean that's that's a that's a that's a key thing for consideration in terms of you know i always say to people um you know try to do some sort of remote sump try to try to do something where you're not having to worry about cramming all the equipment underneath a uh, a fish yeah. tank stand but it's not easy right because you know a lot of times you just don't have that kind of space yeah it's um you know, I, 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 I've watched a lot of your videos and I love your setup. And, you know, once the kids are out of the house doing their own thing as adults, I'm like, that's, that's my goal right there, you know, is, and, and you're, um, there's a lot of attention to detail in your setup. But you know what, dude, really it's not, clean. it's not, it's not pretty to look at. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's clean in terms of the, uh, the execution of it all, but, uh, my wire management sucks. That's <laughs> <laughs> so does mine. Well, I always make it look clean. And then I, as soon as I got to take a pump out and clean it or something, it's like, oh, what did I, you know, sometimes wire management is more of a pain in the ass than it's worth because, you know. And, and, you know, that was one yeah. of the things I noticed that they refilled their studio was the wire management that Jake had put together. And, and uh, Evan, who else was, uh, was uh, responsible for that stuff, was immaculate. And um, that yeah. is something that uh, I strive for. You know, in the future, that's kind of like my resolution moving forward is to have better wire management. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I do okay with it, but yeah, it's funny. I sent a picture when I started because I I moved my tank down to the basement for a couple of years, and uh, had I known I'd be working from home post COVID, I may have kept it there. But you know, uh, pre COVID, I started to think, oh, I miss having the tank upstairs, and I didn't really work from home in the basement much. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I, you know, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, so I, I sent Jake a picture like, look, I got the sump in and look at my nice wire management. He was like, yeah, it's okay. I think you do better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's just his honesty, you know? So. Well, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. There's just so many different degrees in terms of, you know, how people, uh, can engineer things to look really really good with a lot of equipment i i've, I've always been amazed yeah. at people that just have you know all their stuff underneath the uh underneath the, the the tank in the stand and it just it looks immaculate to me and that wouldn't be possible for me i i just um I, it's not in my dna in terms of you know i i i'm i'm good up to a certain point but then it just kind of like falls apart for me in terms of the um you know i I, I, I guess I put all my effort into my display tanks in terms of trying to, um, you know, make them look the way I think they should be looking. I mean, I think you've got the best of both worlds where you are able to maintain uh, an overall aesthetic of the tank in the room without it looking like a science project, but then have the space to have elaborate, you know, life support systems. Um, I, I think that's the right way to go. And, you know, for me, um, I'm okay with making compromises. And I, I something I see in the hobby a lot is that folks, uh, and it's easy for me to say this because I'm, I'm not really uh, all into SPS much, as much as I was in the past, right? And LPS and softy corals are forgiving. But, um, you know, people are, you know, people watch the videos online of people with products and they say, okay, this is the best light, you know? And you need four of these, you know, panel lights hanging above your tank and you got to have a CO2 scrubber and you got to have a calc reactor and a calcium reactor. And you got to, and the next thing you know, your tank looks like a science project in your living room. Yeah. If you, if you don't have like what you have or a basement or somewhere to sort of <laughs> hide that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm one of those people that's like, well, and I've talked to Jake about this on reef therapy is. Sometimes your your limitations or your compromises is where your creativity arises. And I'm like, okay, you know, maybe I don't have wall-to-wall lights and I can't stuff a frag in every nook and cranny of the tank. And, you know, m- maybe, you know, some of my parameters aren't perfect because I, I keep things more simple. Like I, I have a lot of admiration and maybe it's misguided, but I love simplicity. Uh, you know, when you look at... Um, uh, 
I'm blanking on the guy's name. Uh, he has amazing reefs out in California. Um, shoot, uh, Reef Builders is a great video on the on him. Oh, I think um, I know you're talking about. Yeah, Ali, yeah. Ali, and he has you know it's like oh here's this beautiful display and it's you know it's got three things plugged in. It's got a skimmer, a return pump, and a metal halide. Well, and a heater, I guess. And I love that simplicity, you know. So even my tank. Uh, what's running it is very simple, but then I have a lot of disaster recovery stuff with the apex that's complicated. So a lot of float switches, leak deten detectors. If this float activates, do this. If this, you know, um, and I saw somebody ask about automated water exchanges. I do have a dose in my basement. So sometimes when work life and family life gets a little busy, but I feel like, you know, I look at the tank and I'm like, ah, I think it could use a water change. It's kind of nice to just mix up a batch of salt and then I have a, a button I press that activates the apex uh, dose to do a water change for me. So I, I do have some crazy weird automation that probably complicated. I always think like if I get hit by a bus and my wife has to figure out how to keep this thing running, she's going to be cussing my name, <laughs> right? Because it's like, what does this do? What, why is there two dosing pumps? And what do these buttons do? But yeah, um, my tank, my tanks will be you, screwed. Yeah, I, I, I have a, um, excuse my language, but I have an oh shit doc in my, in my safe that just tells my wife, like, you know, not just like, Hey, financials. If, if I, you know, I like to go backpacking and go up to Alaska and stuff. So I'm like, if I get eaten by a bear, <laughs> Here's here's the basics you need to know. But there's a whole chapter on my reef tank, and most of it is just um, I have a really good reef store called Pure Reef Local, and the owner is really great, and the people that work there are really great. I'm like, just call them. You know, I, you know I haven't come up with a document like that, and I really should, but I've given my wife a couple of names, and um, the uh, the names of the, uh, the folks that I've, I've given her to, to reach out to in case I do uh, fall into a, uh, you know, a, a, a ditch or whatever like that. These people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I should probably. <laughs> You're gonna get a random phone call. <laughs> I should probably say something to him. A couple of uh, comments here. Amanda Meckley, um, uh, speaking of wire management, that was one of Jake's pet peeves. He would always do wire management here when he visited. Laugh out loud. <laughs> Jason Langer, uh, my wire management is terrible. I'm OCD about a lot of things, but that's something I just shake my head at and walk away. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I, I agree. Um, I, Oh, Ali, Ali, thank you yeah. so much, Ali, for the uh, for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Um, economical reef or reef therapy was <clears throat> something I always look forward to after a hard day of work. Um, Sammy thirty one D. I actually cringed off the idea of smashing all the gear into my cabinets. I, it's so so hard to achieve a clean cabinet. I totally agree. Um, Salty Dad, I hope Mark is a guest more often. Well, we'd love to have you on there, Mark. This was uh, another um, awesome uh, treat. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so here, here's a funny story. I'm not even sure I should tell this story, but, um, <laughs> Oh, then it's going to be good. Yeah. It's not, it's not a crazy it story or something like that. It's actually some, <laughs> some, some, somebody, uh, Trump Jake in terms of, uh, keeping things neat. Do you, do you know Steve Wiest? Oh yeah. yeah. Oregon reef. He was probably the most iconic reef tank back in the day. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how many gallons it was, but it was just like this beautifully aquascaped um you know reef tank and just so well known and and everybody knew steve weiss but he's he's back in the hobby i guess he's been back in the hobby for the last um couple years after a bit of a uh, hiatus and so i had the chance to talk to him at the uh at the reef builders uh studio and and just his yeah. his um philosophy in terms of hiding equipment is just like amazing you know it's like you cannot yeah. see a cord or a power head inside the tank you can't see anything you know, inside of his, um, his tank. And, and, uh, so I just found that fascinating, but he, he told me, and I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for telling this, uh, but he said that when he walked into the reef builder studio for the first time and, and Jake was like, you know, I, 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 I guess Jake spent a lot of time, you know, cleaning and making sure everything was like in order. And the first <laughs> thing that Steve like pointed out to him was like, as soon as he walked in, there's like some MP on his flagship peninsula tank. What's the deal with the MP40s at the uh, the end of that tank? <laughs> you know, why am I seeing these you know recirculating pumps in this uh, tank? So that you know, for for Jake to be uh, you know kind of schooled in terms of uh, not having the cleanest possible look, I thought that was sort of ironic. Yeah, if um, 
You know, when I would go on uh, vacation, you know, Jake would be like, uh, it's, it was always weird how fortuitous this was where I seemed to always go on vacation when he would have a visitor. And so he'd be like, well, since you're out of town, do you mind if I, you know, uh, do a reef therapy with this other person? And I was like, no, that's awesome because then I get to be a listener. Yeah. I get to enjoy it as a listener. And uh, if you're, uh, if, in terms of attention to detail, if you ever listen to him uh, Steve was on reef therapy with Jake yeah. and reluctantly, apparently, talk, because I, I, I asked yeah. him to be on this live stream and I, I'm not sure that's going to be happening, but, uh, yeah. From what I gathered, and I think he did this, uh, he did this to several people, um, is, uh, once they showed up to the studio, he just get the mic out <laughs> like, all right, we're doing this. <laughs> so he didn't have a choice in that matter. I think he did that to Than as well uh, okay. from, uh, title gardens. <laughs> um, but yeah, just I remember listening to that, and I just felt like a crappy reef keeper after <laughs> listening to that. I'm like, dude, like his his how he keeps his sand bed meticulous. I thought, man, I suck. I keep a sewage tank. You know, <laughs> Ali says uh, Steve once put me in a chokehold because I had a couple of corals in the sand bed. Ha ha. I love Steve. He was just <laughs> at my shop a couple of months back. <laughs> yeah, he was. It, yeah, he he's next level in terms of attention to Crazy. detail. All right, dude. Well, listen, Mark. This is uh, this has been awesome, and I don't want to keep you any uh, any longer. This is uh, this has been, I think, great therapy for a lot of people, you know, out there in the listening audience, including myself. So it was a uh, it was a real pleasure to have you on again and to talk uh, reef with you. No, thank you, Keith, for having me on a second time. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking to you in person in reef stock, and uh, yeah, this was great. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no, listen, um, rooting for you in terms of being on uh, at, at, uh, at, at some level in terms of YouTube, wherever that may be. Love to, uh, to see you more often for sure. So, uh, yeah, and, and would love that. to uh, obviously have you back on as a guest uh, in the near future. So, Any, right, anytime. Dude. Well, listen, happy to. I want to thank all of you folks out there for tuning in. And I want to thank Mark again for being on the live stream. I also want to thank both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for sponsoring this uh, program. So um, I also want to thank Paul, the moderator, who is also the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Uh, please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to this hobby. I um, also want to let everybody know that all episodes of Rapping with Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my next Rapping with Reef Bum live stream We'll be with the Reef Beef Boys, Ben and Rich. That'll be next Thursday, March 30th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I've got some great, great guests coming up, including uh, Julian Sprung, Charles Delbeek. Uh, who else I got coming up? Uh, I, I got a whole uh, bunch of great uh, folks coming on, coming on the show. Uh, Tulio is going to be on, I know, in a, in, a, in a few weeks. So, yeah, check it out on reefbum.com under the, uh, the YouTube section for all the guests that will be um, coming on the show. So until next time, everybody, be safe and be well, and we will see you next time. Adios.